Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It is August 25th, 2022, and we are excited to have another episode in our amazing series with uh, Mike from LDS Discussions. Today's episode is on the Word of Wisdom. For those of you who don't have a Mormon background, the Word of Wisdom is a health code that Mormons live by. Mormons are often known as being those people who don't drink alcohol or don't drink tea or don't chew tobacco or smoke or don't uh, drink alcohol or anything like that or do drugs. Now, we're going to get into it today. And of course, we're not the only group or even religious group who have beliefs like that. Um, but regardless, the word of wisdom is what a Mormon would think of when they're thinking of their health code. And it was a health code that was given uh, by revelation, uh, according to our founder, Joseph Smith, to our founder, Joseph Smith, way back in the Kirtland days, which is in the 1830s. Um, and today we're going to be talking about its origins and, uh, you know, how it's been emphasized over time and maybe some of the issues or problems with it if you're trying to understand or look at the ch the Mormon church uh, kind of objectively as it relates to its truth claims. So that is today's episode. I do want to remind everyone that this is all based on the amazing work done by Mike at LDSDiscussions.com, where he has a series of essays that he has released and has done so much important work. Please check it out. Um, it's, it's a real contribution to our people. I also want to just remind people that all of these LDS Discussions episodes are available on Anchor. They're available on Spotify, both in audio format and in video format. They're available on the Apple uh, podcast app in audio format, pretty much anywhere you get your podcasts. And of course, the video versions are available on YouTube in the LDS Discussions uh, YouTube playlist under the Mormon Stories Podcast YouTube channel. So that is uh, kind of the introduction for today. We're trying to make these in introductions tight. Hey, Mike, <laughs> welcome back to Mormon Stories Podcast. What's up, everybody? It's great to have you. It's nice to be back for another one. And and uh, I think it's kind of been nice the last few weeks kind of doing them uh, that are not quite going through like biblical scholarship and uh, Book of Mormon scripture stuff is nice to have a little bit of a change and going through some of the history. And so today will kind of be a good continuation from last week's episode on changes to the Doctrine and Covenants to go over the Word of Wisdom, which is obviously a very impactful uh, revelation in, in the church today and and um, looking at kind of how it was treated at the time and and what may have changed with regards to how the church has interpreted it. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's just jump in. Tell us a bit about uh, your first slide. Yeah. And just we're kind of, as we've been doing these overview episodes, we've been talking about how they all kind of tie into each other in different ways. And uh, we've talked about how Joseph Smith has had a pattern of pulling surrounding ideas and repurposing them in the name of God as a theological vehicle. As David Bakavoy would say, he's kind of actualizing um, information in a way that makes sense and fits in with his theological goals. And the word of wisdom feels like a, a perfect example of this because it's going to incorporate ideas that are very strong in his lifetime, in his time and place um, that are not only going to be repurposed by Joseph, but later the leaders of the church are going to have to repurpose them again uh, as they try to figure out how to implement a revelation that was never a commandment in the first place and also becomes kind of dated um, as we get advances in nutrition and science and all of that. And so this particular topic does not have like a full out uh, gospel topics essay. So we're going to use an, a video that the church put out, I believe three years ago, I think it was 2019. And it's a series of videos they did called Now You Know, and it features kind of like a cartoony, in my opinion, somewhat childish kind of artwork um, and highlights uh, some of these more goof, uh, troubling, controversial uh, issues of the church um, in a very short, concise video. So we're going to use that almost as if it's an essay because they give us how they view it as a history, how they view it as um, the revelation and also how the church interprets it today. And so I think it'll be a good backdrop um, almost as a way to look at kind of the apologetic response will be to look directly at how the church frames it. Excellent. All right. So let's, uh, let's jump in. And, and I'm, and I think these videos are kind of campy. They're kind of fun and, and we'll have a bit of a multimedia extravaganza. Yeah. Uh, 
instead of just kind of text and, and images. So I'm kind yeah. Of- so hopefully this will be a little bit of a change with some breakup with some video and and uh, hopefully that'll give a little break from hearing us talk as well. So that'll be good. <laughs> All right. So here we have the first video uh, from from the LDS Church introducing the Word of Wisdom. Right. Yep. All right. Let's kick it off. Members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints live by a health code called the Word of Wisdom. What is the Word of Wisdom, and why do millions of Latter-day Saints around the world follow it? Let's take a closer look. Prophet Joseph Smith received the Word of Wisdom by Revelation in 1833. He wrote the Revelation down and canonized it in a collection of revelations called the Doctrine and Covenants, which Latter-day Saints view as Scripture. The Revelation is recognized by most as the reason why Latter-day Saints abstain from alcohol, tobacco, coffee, tea, and drug use. But to understand why the Word of Wisdom came about, we first need to know some historical context. Okay, so that's uh, that's kind of the introduction. And so far, as someone raised Mormon, as someone who was Mormon until I was 45, there was nothing there I heard that was wrong or objectionable or misleading. Yeah. Yep, I agree. So yeah, that's uh. Remember- so, oh no, I'm so, yeah. So, so if we go to the next slide, it's I, I agree with you. I think the opening paragraph is fairly straightforward. I think they're stating um, basically what the word of wisdom is, is with regards to how the church views it today. Um, the one thing I wanted to add, and, and you see this a lot in their videos, is that when they do the imagery of Joseph Smith writing down the revel- revelation, oh yeah, um, they have him sitting there, kind of writing it himself, super scholarly. Um, and I'm not positive on the word of wisdom, but I believe this is early enough to where Joseph is still using the rock and the hat to read the revelations. And so, of course, historically speaking, I believe they should be using uh, the video clip of Joseph with his head in the hat with a scribe uh, writing down the words next to him. And, you know, it's a small thing. I get it. And the word of wisdom might have been after he um, stopped using the stone. I don't think it is, but it could be. It's kind of in that gray area. But it's just one of those areas where, and we're going to see this more as this video goes along, they try to make this imagery incredibly positive and faith-promoting when it comes to the church. And then when it comes to the outside of the church, um, they do not give such charity. And the other part I would just add is, while the Word of Wisdom today is why members are not allowed to drink alcohol, uh, the text of the Word of Wisdom does allow itself for beer, which we're going to get into as we go. But it just shows right off the bat here that the messiness of the wording of the revelation is going to be um, problematic for this video. And also, for, you know, we'll mention the overview. And just to note right off the bat that the church is proclaiming the word of wisdom as it has been redefined today by leaders as kind of the way it was originally intended. And it just does not match um, with how the revelation was originally recorded. And that's not even getting into the historical background of it. Okay. All right. So a couple little quibbles, a little bit yeah, of background, but, but pretty so straightforward. Far, yeah. So far, pretty straightforward. And I agree with you. That has been a major point of deception for Mormons for over a century. The church, well, at least for 70, 80 years, the church has depicted consistently Joseph Smith as translating with the Urim and Thummim, uh, with the breastplate and the spectacles, when we now know it's the stone in the hat. And it was only when the internet embarrassed the church into coming up with other depictions um yeah fair that's a fair criticism well yeah and i think when you talk about revelations um a lot of times especially even when i first started reading about the stone in the hat for the book of mormon i did not realize the revelations were done the same way at first um and then you start seeing i think it's some of the headers it'll say like receive through the urim and thumb and all of a sudden you're like oh crap that means he was receiving the revelations just as he did uh, claim to translate the Book of Mormon. Oh, and also just as he claimed to see hidden treasure that he charged people money to look for. And that's why we talk about these episodes being connected because treasure digging is using the same technique as translating the Book of Mormon, which is using the same technique as receiving these early revelations. And yeah. we talked about that a lot in the last episode. But it is important to note, even though we did talk about it a lot in the last episode, just that that is something that the church is not going to put in these videos that Joseph is using that rock and a hat to receive these early revelations. And I know this one's possibly after that. I'm not positive, but it's right in that, that kind of area where he's starting to, to not use it as much. Yeah. It's an example of whitewashing yep. your history Yeah, and sanitizing it, which is a form of deception. Okay. Let's continue with the video. The word of wisdom appeared at a time of intense public debate in the United States about alcohol abuse. 
As early as the 1810s, rapidly growing industrialization and alcohol use had begun breaking down previously held social norms. By the 1830s, many adults in the United States had been raised in families where alcoholic beverages were consumed at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Many people became concerned about the social and health consequences of increased alcohol consumption. The temperance movement grew as reformers called for abstinence from hard liquor. Many involved with the movement went further, taking a pledge against all alcoholic beverages, including beer. Some even recommended coffee as a substitute for alcohol, given that clean water was not always available. At the same time, some reformers spoke out against tobacco use. Okay, do you mind if I give you my quick reaction to that? No, go ahead. As, as someone who has not really seen these videos or paid attention to them, but as someone who has raised Mormon for 45 years, that's more of a background on the word of wisdom than I ever received in my 45 years in the church. It was always sort of like Emma saw that some of the elders in Kirtland were chewing tobacco and spitting the tobacco on the floor of the temple. She complained. Joseph went to God and got a revelation. Never was the word of wisdom discussed to me as something coming out of the context of the temperance movement that... I mean, I love it that they're doing that now, but that was not my my experience for four and a half decades because it's it was important, I think, for the church to have us all believe that Joseph just got his revelations from God. If the church is just telling us, oh, Joseph saw that thing and then brought it in, and then he saw that thing and brought it in, it makes it a lot less miraculous, um, you know, than if he's getting it straight from God. And that's why I believe a lot of that context was never given to us. Now that's just my, yeah. my gut reaction. No, that's pretty much it. So yeah, I mean, my reaction's on the slides and I, I pretty much said the same thing because- <laughs> We're I, validating it, each other. It, well, as a convert, I remember very, very specifically, because when I took the discussions, I took them with people I knew and um, who were in the church. And um, at the time it was my girlfriend, who's now my wife. And I remember very specifically my now mother-in-law telling me about how Joseph Smith knew that smoking and drinking was bad before anyone else knew it. And because he got through God. And I remember thinking at the time that that was pretty cool because, you know, this was in the late nineties. So you figure in the late nineties, they were still just really kind of getting to the point where they were really hammering down on, you know, advertising smoking and, and really outlining the the health dangers. I mean, they knew it was bad at that point, but it was really becoming more mainstream. And so you're thinking you're, you're living in a time when, it's kind of becoming common knowledge, but like to think that 160 years earlier, Joseph Smith was one of the first people to declare it. I thought that's amazing. So to find this out, you're like, oh, he just took another thing that was being talked about heavily in his area, in his time and place. There's nothing, like you said, there's nothing miraculous about it. And as we've talked about, like with the Book of Mormon, it's explainable. You, when When you claim something's a miracle and then you have all of these ways you can explain it. Uh, it, it's just, it's very ordinary and, and yeah. it's actually what you expect at this point, um, yeah. from Joseph Smith. So I won't read all of this just because we kind of covered it, but yeah, it's the same thing. Like, so I want to give them credit because this video does state that this was something that was being talked about, that there was a growing public movement against alcohol, tobacco, and other substances, um, because of the way people acted when they were drunk, because of the fact that, you know, tobacco was leaving stains all over and smoke and just kind of gross. And, um, you know, as I mentioned here too, it's just when I was took the discussions, it was told me that he, no one could have possibly known this. And this is just another area where Joseph Smith bringing surrounding influence. And so as we talked about in the last few weeks alone, Joseph Smith, um, you know, didn't mention the Melchizedek and Aaronic priesthoods until the Campbellite movement brought over the idea of split priesthoods. Uh, you mentioned before the multiple tears of heaven is from Emmanuel Swedenborg. Uh, the first vision we talked about in that episode that there were like three dozen accounts um, in Joseph Smith's area that had very similar language, almost identical language to Joseph Smith's first vision, the temple endowment from the Masonic ceremony. And so we're just seeing more and more patterns of Joseph Smith taking surrounding material and then using that as a vehicle for his own ideas. And so I want to give credit to the church for declaring this up front because it is something that was not talked about, certainly in my time in the church. And um, so while I give him credit for it, it also is quite a surprise um, to learn that this was not very unique uh, for Joseph Smith to come up with. Yeah. 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 And so I, I love it that they're now kind of acknowledging the surrounding influences. Terrell Givens has now said that Joseph was an inspired syncretist, which is his elegant way of, of creating a euphemism 
to explain the fact that basically he just he just imported uh, surrounding influences into all his doctrines and revelations. But I, you know, I've already said it, but that was not the Mormonism I was raised in. And that's not the Joseph Smith I was sold. And so this is a bit of a bait and switch to me. So. Yeah. I mean, it is, it's just one of those things where, you know, we, it's just different than it yeah. was told. And now it's almost being told, like it's been told the whole time. And that's one of those things where you're like, come on, like the, we know this is not, I could tell you, I mean, I remember the, there are certain, there are certain things I was told during those discussions and during my temple experience that I will never forget. And that's one of them just because it was at the time, like, holy crap, I, that's a pretty good proof. He was a prophet. But like you said, you find out that this is not how it happened and certainly not um, pulling it out of thin air. So it's, it's a yeah. problem. Yeah. 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 Okay. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah. So next slide um, it's just, you know, again, we're talking about how, unique is Joseph's word of wisdom revelation. And so we, they mentioned the temperance movement in the video and the temperance movement was very much a thing by the 1820s, uh, simplicity of health. And this is actually from the Mormon stories essay on the word of wisdom. That's on your website. I think Michael Brown put it together, I believe. Right. Yep. Yep. And it's super good. And, um, so I copied from you guys cause it was easier than typing this out myself and it was really well done. So, um, he said the temperance movement was very much a thing by the late 1820s. Simplicity of Health, published in 1829, elaborates on every item in the Word of Wisdom. Means of Preserving Health was published in 1806 and contains every bit of the Word of Wisdom. Avoidance of alcohol, coffee, tea, and tobacco, and sparing use of meat, as well as eating fruits in season. The Journal of Health, published in Philadelphia, August 25th, 1830, also contains every aspect of the Word of Wisdom. The Kirtland chapter of the Temperance Society found, formed in 1830, shortly before Mormons arrived from New York. Presbyterian minister Sylvester Graham conducted a speaking tour for almost 15 years, extolling the virtues of abstaining from alcohol, smoking, tea, coffee, and eating a diet of mo mainly of grains, local fruits, and vegetables. Meat was expressly forbidden. He was popular and well-known in the late 1820s to 1840 and also invented the graham cracker. It's kind of a cool fact. Um, February 26, 1833 was National Day of Temperance, which prompted much discussion in Nauvoo. Um, that might mean Kirtland. I'm not sure. It was common practice at the school of elders to chew, spit, and smoke tobacco. The ladies, as tradition would have it, were tasked with cleaning up the boys' mess. Emma was prompted to lament, it would be a good thing if a revelation could be had declaring the use of tobacco a sin and commanding its suppression. The matter was taken up and joked about. One of the brethren suggests that the revelation should also provide for a total abstinence from coffee and tea drinking, intending this as a counter dig at the sisters. Far from a groundbreaking revelation from God about health, Joseph Smith, Emma, and the School of Elders were simply discussing the events of their day. Imagine their surprise when the following day, February 27, 1833, Smith brought forth revelation from God that conveniently ended the debate using the very language of the temperance movement. I mean, it's just, I don't know well, what else to say. So I'll give you my reaction to that. On, on the one hand, yeah, it sounds like, uh, how is that revelation if Joseph's like paying attention to the temperance movement all around him in Kirtland? He's getting feedback from Emma, talking to the elders about some things, goes back to God, comes back and basically puts all that into King James English kind of revelation. So like, you know, all that's true. And, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, super, it's not, it would be like I watched Oprah and Dr. Phil and, or, or, uh, you know, who's the Dave Ramsey guy. And he's like, don't go to, don't, don't get yeah, into yeah. that. And then I go back and, and receive a revelation that that's bad. Like, you know, it's not super remarkable. It's clearly influenced by those surround you, surrounding you. You don't even give them credit, right? And then yep. you call it revelation. So on the one end, that's problematic. The apologetic voice in me is saying, what do you expect, Joseph, to kind of pull things out of thin air? Of course he's going to, you know, and the church would even probably admit this earlier, that of course he he received revelations in response to questions he was asking or situations he was confronting. And so <clears throat> I can hear a progressive Mormon apologist say, come on, Mike, of course he's influenced by people surround him. And that's a feature, not a bug that Emma's influence in because it shows that he cares about his wife and he cares about women. And then he's able to take influence. So like, and I, I think at the end, you claim this isn't a smoking gun. I'm just trying to be fair in my response to what I've read so far. Yeah. And my response, though, to that would be, 
it's one because yeah, the the, the the apologetic response absolutely is to say Joseph Smith himself says that you are to seek knowledge out of the best books, out of the best sources, all that stuff. So I get that. My problem is when you claim to get a revelation, even if it is prompted by Emma, I have no problem with that either, because of course you're going to be prompted by something, right? But when you give a revelation that is taking everything you know in your worldview and adding nothing else, it shows that the revelation is not from a source other than your own mind, because Joseph Smith, and we're going to, we're going to hit this a few times in this thing, he could have saved lives in the church if his revelation included boiling water, which happened to be something nobody knew at that time was a way to keep healthy. I mean, part of the reason they drank alcohol for breakfast is because it was a way to keep water from making you sick. And yet in this revelation, Joseph Smith does not get anything that is not talked about at the time, such as boiling water. And we'll mention this later in in this episode that leads to people in in the early church being killed uh, or dying. And a lot of them getting very, very sick because God apparently didn't seem deem fit to give Joseph any knowledge beyond what he knew. And I realize that sounds very sharp, but at the same time, that's the reality. So if you want to say, isn't it great that Emma prompted it? I would say, absolutely. That being said, that prompting should lead to something more than what was already being talked about in his day. Yeah. Wouldn't it be amazing if, if DNC 89 began with, for behold, there are these things called germs and this thing called germ theory. Yeah. And there's bacteria and microbes, things behold that thou cannot see yet make thy sick, you know? Well, yeah. These even reasons, you know? Yeah. Treat just food a, this way so that you don't get sick. Now that would be revelation. Right? That's just it. Just imagine if there's a verse in there that says, and I, the Lord deem that um, ye shall boil all water before consuming for unboiled water can lead to great illness, something like that. That's something that wasn't known very well at the time. And yet we don't have any of that. And, you know, it it would be kind of like, um, I don't mean want to sound like a jerk here, but if you had a a pandemic in America in the 2020s and you had a prophet who was a church and you had apologists saying, or a prophet in the church who was a doctor and you had apologists saying, oh my goodness, how lucky are we that we have a doctor as a prophet during a pandemic and that prophet didn't give us any information beyond what the CDC was giving us, I would say that's a pretty good tell that God's not speaking to him because he couldn't even give us the information to keep us healthy before the government could, which tells you there's no real use for a prophet when you've got the government who's going to get there first anyways. I mean, just hypothetically speaking, of course. Of course, of course. Yeah. All right. Well, let's go to the next little video clip. It was in this social climate in the early 1830s that Joseph Smith started a series of formal classes called the School of the Prophets. This school was an assembly of church leaders who met to discuss and instruct one another in theological and secular learning, such as religion, economics, philosophy, and civic matters. But the attendees frequently smoked, chewed, and spat tobacco, all in the same space where Joseph taught the school and recorded revelations. In addition, Emma Smith, Joseph's wife, was left to clean up the mess and she was disturbed by the men's actions. She spoke to Joseph about it. Joseph inquired of the Lord and received the revelation known as the word of wisdom. Okay, so there it's mentioning Emma's influence. Yeah, and and that's pretty straightforward as well. I mean, I I don't know if you, because some of these don't have like tons of reaction. I just, I feel like some of the times, I mean, you'll see in the slides, I I have some thoughts on it, but it's not like anything horrific. So one thing I'll note, and this is one of the things that drives me nuts about these videos, is they use very cartoony graphics, and in a lot of ways, they do it in a way that privileges the church, and it kind of goes against outsiders. So if you look at this, when they show people in the church smoking and drinking, they're up like in that top image. They're super scholarly. It's almost like they're sitting there in a class, like going over like these really deep philosophical ideas. And then when they talk about anyone outside the church drinking, they look like a bunch of hunched over drunks on the bottom. I just feel like that's a very... Um, manipulative way to use imagery to, you know, try to elevate church members, like saying, even when we did it, we were still looking better than them. And and I feel that's just, you know, it it, it might be splitting hairs a bit, but I just, that's why these now, you know, videos, I've covered a few of them on the website. They're misleading in the data, but they're also really misleading in the imagery. And so imagery is important. They know that that's why they're putting these together. Um, So, you know, that's just, it's a, I know it's a small thing, but I just like using the images because it's, it's easy to show um, how they frame, you know, us versus them. It's a little bit manipulative. I uh, think so, but a little bit marketing. Yeah. And you know, one of the things that people in the church don't know, and I certainly didn't know as a member is that Joseph Smith drank after the word of wisdom. And so almost every member of the church was drinking after the word of wisdom. And 
Um, we even have record that Joseph Smith was drinking wine on the day he died, which is crazy to think, considering at that point he would have had his endowment, all these other things, and yet he was drinking on the day he died. And um, John Taylor recalled um, from the history of the church, sometime after dinner, we sent for some wine. It has been reported by some that this was taken as a sacrament. It was no such thing. Our spirits were generally dull and heavy, and it was sent for to revive us. I think it was Captain Jones who went after it, but they would not suffer him to return. I believe we all drank of the wine and gave some to one or two of the prison guards. And so, um, you know, it's pretty clear that that they drank wine. And um, so three years after the revelation we have from the history of the church, we then partook of some refreshments and our hearts were made glad with the fruit of the vine. This is an accord. This is according to the pattern set by our savior himself. And we feel disposed to patronize all the institutions of heaven. So clearly they view the word of wisdom different than the church has redefined it today. And until the day he died, he was drinking alcohol. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm just going to say that that part is significant to me and it's meaningful because never that I can remember in all of my church education in 45 years, including seminary, four, four years of early morning seminary in high school, all the Sunday school and priesthood lessons, and then all the religious education at BYU. Never was I told that Joseph kept drinking alcohol. Yep. It wasn't just the it wasn't just the drinking wine the night before he was martyred. The Nauvoo house had a bar. Yep. Like he drank, you know, strong liquor. He drank wine. All the other members of the church did. And I'm sure you're going to get to this, but prophets, seers, and revelators all the way into the 20th century, the early 20th century, the pioneers, they yep. were all still drinking alcohol. And yep. They, they were all still drinking alcohol. And that was that information was withheld from us, I believe, intentionally. In fact, I don't know if you mentioned this, but like when Leonard Arrington was called to be church historian in 1972, and he started releasing by the church, he was a credible historian, and he started releasing articles. I seem to recall that like some of the articles he released talked about alcohol or tobacco consumption by some of the apostles after Joseph Smith died. And that literally made some of the modern apostles, the contemporary apostles, like, I don't know, Ezra Tapp Benson or Boyd K. Packer or whoever it was, um, that, that made them uncomfortable such that they would tell Leonard Arrington that they were uncomfortable with these articles. And ultimately, after 10 years, they shut Leonard Arrington down, closed down the history department, and uh, and scuttled it all for another couple decades until the internet internet kind of came about, and again that just showed that the church made a conscious effort yeah. to hide and or deceive us as members from this important information about the word of wisdom. Yeah, and uh, I don't have the Larry Arrington stuff, so I'm just glad you brought that up. I do have instances where they do whitewash their history yeah, okay. because they don't want you to realize it. So yeah, I mean it's it's just like we talked about with these last few episodes. There have been intentional um, actions by church leaders to hide information from members, and and that should tell people that this is a problem. And not, you know, it, again, unless you're using special pleading to say, well, it's different because we trust these leaders. Um, you know, what would you say if other leaders were constantly rewriting their history and hiding it from members? And it would not be a positive reaction. So, yeah, it's not good. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so, all right, let's go to. Uh the next slide. And the next slide is one that I think is really interesting because this was one that to me was kind of a shocker, which is that many of the early visionary experiences within the church all included and involved alcohol. So um, I think the first time I came across it was when I was doing the saints chapter by chapter stuff. And you're reading about basically they were having so many visions in Kirtland when they were dedicating the temple that Joseph Smith had to basically tell them to stop drinking because they were basically acting out of control. And it's not to say that all the church members were habitual drunks. It's just to say that it sure seems like when you fast and then you drink a lot of alcohol, things happen pretty quick. And so um, from the temple dedication in Kirtland, they said, during this meeting, the men began to speak in tongues as the Savior's apostles had done at Pentecost. Some at the meeting saw heavenly fire resting on those who spoke. Others saw angels. Outside, saints saw a bright cloud in a pillar of fire rest over the temple. And then... There's another mention of about these experiences having uh, having uh, been begun after you know taking bread and wine after fasting in the temple. It says Joseph and his counselors went home, leaving the twelve to take charge of the meeting. 
The Spirit again descended on the men in the temple, and they began to prophesy, speak in tongues, and exhort one another in the gospel. Ministering angels appeared to some men, and a few others had visions of the Savior. And this is one of those ones that obviously has to do with the with the word of wisdom because of the fact that they were drinking after the word of wisdom. Um, it also shows how uh, these visions that you talk about in the church and and sometimes uh, tend to happen after uh, drinking wine with Joseph Smith. And and I know there's a lot of theories on if Joseph put anything in there, and I have no idea what to make of that. I would just point out that even without putting anything in there, if you have people fasting all day and then you drink a bunch of wine, you're very much more likely to start having visions or experiences that would not happen if you were, you know, not drinking or, you know, even if you just had a, a full stomach and you drank something. So, um, you know, alcohol played a role in some of these to the point where Joseph Smith had to actually clamp down on the church for having too many visionary experiences, which again, imagine this kind of stuff happening today. It wouldn't because people don't have this worldview today, but it just shows how, um, it shows the worldview that the early members had with regards to how you could have visions, how you could speak in tongues. When today we look at that and go, yeah, this, none of this happens. So I just want to point that out for not just the word of wisdom, but the idea of revelation, the idea of personal revelation, the idea of visions, and just to note that you can induce them by using substances such as alcohol in an empty stomach. Yeah. And we may talk about this later, but you know, these days psychedelics are all the rage in, yep. in, in the United States, but also amongst ex-Mormons and even some active devoted Mormons. And there's been a lot of people theorizing that maybe Joseph Smith or early saints used entheogens or psychedelics, yeah. ma magic mushrooms, or you know, who knows. But what we do know is that things like peyote or marijuana or, you know, even alcohol can, uh, you know, can influence certain parts of your brain that can make yep. it more likely that you would experience what some would call a spiritual experience. And that's, yep. again, this is something that was never mentioned to us growing yeah. up in the church. We're told the miracles of Kirtland and, you know, the spirit of God, like a fire is burning and that pillars are descending from the sky and angels are being seen above the temple. Never are we told that a bunch of the members are drunk. Yeah. I mean, that's just it. And like I said, I, I've listened to some of the um, podcasts and presentations on like the whole entheogen theory and, and all of like using mushrooms, all that stuff. I don't know what to make of it. It's compelling, but at the same time, I don't have like direct evidence for it. I would just say that you can see in your own life, if you uh, are with people who are drinking a lot, especially if you know they haven't eaten anything that day, they're going to be acting in a way where they are more likely to think they're experiencing something or claim to be experiencing something. And as you said, this is just something that's not noted. It would be nice if in the scriptures it said, after they fasted all day before the temple dedication and drank a bunch of wine with Joseph Smith, they began to see these things and you go, Oh yeah. Okay. That makes more sense. Um, but of course it, they leave that part out. So it seems more miraculous when again, a lot of these early miracles are explained, or at least we can look at the contemporary accounts and show that they're maybe not quite what they were, but either way, they're not what we're being told later yeah. on that they are. And it's just important to note that here because it not only shows that maybe these visions were impacted by alcohol, but it's impacted by alcohol after the word of wisdom was written. Yeah. And it's always about informed consent. The church is just systematically withheld, changed, edited, or withheld or whitewashed information from its membership and from the general public. And that's, that's, going to be a stain until they just don't up to that. Well, yeah. Yep. I mean, yeah, yeah, we don't need to keep going on that. So, and, and, you know, one of the things we mentioned is that one of the biggest issues with the word of wisdom is, is kind of how and why the revelation happened. And the church does note in the video that Emma's frustrated with cleaning up after these meetings, which led to Joseph inquiring of the Lord, which makes sense. And what's particularly interesting about this uh, revelation is a late reminiscence from David Whitmer as to the origin of the revelation. And he said, some of the men were excessive chewers of the filthy weed and their disgusting slobbering and spitting caused Mrs. Smith to make the ironical remark that it would be a good thing if a revelation could be had declaring the use of tobacco a sin and commanding its suppression. The matter was taken up and joked about. One of the brethren suggested that the revelation should also provide for a total abstinence from tea and coffee drinking, including intending this as a counter dig at the sisters. And, you know, it needs to be noted this is a late account um, from what, after the revelation took place, but it's by somebody who was with everyone in the early church. And it's also fits the pattern of Joseph uh, receiving revelation um, in a way that seemed to take care of the problems he had at a given moment. 
And it's also kind of funny that, you know, they um, mentioned tea and coffee drinking uh, to basically get back at Emma. And I, that one to me, I don't know, because they don't mention coffee or tea. They just mention hot drinks. It's just that that was kind of the way um, it was framed. And it just, to me, the bigger picture shows a pattern of Joseph Smith being able to pull from surrounding ideas when he's asked to, to create vehicles, to basically fix problems, whether it's like we talked about in recent weeks with the priesthood to gain authority, the first vision to establish himself as the one person visited by God. Um, we're going to have it later when it comes to polygamy and stuff. And it just shows that revelation is a vehicle for Joseph Smith to get credibility for things that maybe people wouldn't listen to otherwise. And um, the fact that it came a day after Emma asked for it just shows how easily he could receive revelation compared to today. Absolutely. Okay. So we've got another, another video. Yep. Another piece of the video. Another piece of the video. <laughs> yeah. Let's go ahead and run it. The revelation helped the saints navigate many of the issues debated by reformers. And it also addressed Emma's specific concerns. For example, the Lord warned against the consumption of strong drinks, which Latter-day Saints understand to mean alcohol. Also, the Lord cautioned that hot drinks, understood as coffee and tea, were not for the belly, in other words, not to be consumed. Neither was tobacco, which was better used as an herb for sick cattle. Also at the time, some groups, like the Shakers, advised against eating meat, while other groups advocated no restrictions at all. However, in the word of wisdom, the Lord revealed that he ordained meat, both beast and fowl, for the use of man on condition that it be eaten sparingly. The word of wisdom, given in its early American context, did not specifically mention many substances that have since become common. As the world's industries began mass production of such substances, church leaders encouraged Latter-day Saints to use common sense and stay away from harmful habit-forming substances. For example, recreational drugs should be avoided, while the authorized and correct use of prescription drugs is okay. In the Word of Wisdom, the Lord also warns against conspiring men with evil designs, foreshadowing a surge of substance abuse, addiction, and death. Okay, uh, so what are your uh, kind of immediate thoughts or reactions to that? I guess uh, I guess for that, we just go to the next slide, because I, otherwise I'll keep repeating myself. But yeah, I, I think... Absolutely. Yeah, I think for for me, I think the church is glossing over some of the big issues. And for example, the first thing that I think stuck out to me is they present this idea that DNC 89, which is the word of wisdom, that it's understood to mean coffee and tea for hot drinks. And that's just nonsensical. And so I want to read what DNC 89 says about that. They say, and again, hot drinks are not for the body or belly. So early church members took this not only as coffee and tea, but I mean hot soups, which we know can be quite healthy. Um, it can mean coffee, it can mean tea, it can mean hot chocolate, which is also allowed under the word of wisdom apparently today. And, and so we have a very inconsistent use of what hot drinks is. And today you can drink hot chocolate at a temple recommend interview and get your temple recommend. But if you were to say you're a habitual coffee drinker, I guess, depending on the bishop, some will still give it to you, but you can easily be um, forbidden from it. And so they make it sound like we've talked about in these previous episodes about how church history makes everything seem so clean. And the word of wisdom is just not a logical revelation. You know, we're told that hot drinks are in reference to coffee and tea, but you can't drink iced coffee or iced tea and keep a temple recommend. And some apologists will say it's about caffeine, except that you can now drink caffeinated soda. And BYU just made a big uh, PR move in selling Coke products, I think like a year or two. I think I wrote this last year. So it really makes no sense when you look at you can drink, um, you can't drink hot drinks, but you also can't drink iced coffee and tea. Then they'll say it's caffeine, but you, you can drink Coke. You can drink monster energy drinks or, you know, Red Bull or whatever. And so habitual substances or substances that alter your body really aren't the issue. It's very um, subjective. And so there's no further revelation that clarifies hot drinks means just coffee. And even if that were true, it still wouldn't excuse the whole problem of why iced coffee is not okay. And so none of this adds up. And the fact is, all of this is dated to Joseph Smith's time and place, which strips the word of wisdom of any sense of revelation because nothing is unknown from this time. Yeah. And that has always been a super confusing and inconsistent part of Mormonism because people be like, you can't drink coffee and tea? How come? And yeah. It's like, well, some dude a couple hundred years ago received a revelation that said you can't have hot drinks. And they're like, hot drinks? Well, can you drink cold drinks if they're coffee and tea? Well, no. Because modern day prophets have revealed that it's the caffeine. 
Oh, yeah. so you can't drink any caffeine. Well, you could drink, you know, some say you could drink Coke and Diet Coke and some say you can't. Well, Bark's root beer has caffeine. Well, yep. some, some don't know that. And well, doesn't chocolate have caffeine? And, yep. and you know, like you were saying, when you were at BYU, when I was growing up, and I think still at church headquarters, you literally can't get or you couldn't get, like you said, ca Coca-Cola with regular yeah. caffeine. You would get uh, caffeine free Coke. Yep. Right. And uh, caffeine free Diet Coke uh, for, for decades and decades and decades. And so many Orthodox Mormons would kind of flex over yeah. other types of Mormons by saying, well, I'm a real Mormon because I don't drink any. You know, there it was the it was the thing you bragged about in the 80s. Yep. If you had never tried Coke or you never tried a Dr. Pepper, that yep. was a way for you to flex and show that you were a super Orthodox member. But putting all of that silliness aside, like you said. Where's the revelation? What does it mean? Why isn't any of this specified? We're taught that the scriptures are written for our day. Yep. And yet it's very, very clear just in DNC 89 alone that this wasn't written for our day because it makes no sense in, in 1980 or, or even 2022. Yeah. But we're stuck with it because they don't give any additional revelations, right? Yeah, and it makes a lot more sense when you realize that in the 1830s, people believed that if you drank drinks that were too hot, it could ruin, it could hurt hurt your internal organs. So there was a belief that right. drinking coffee was harmful because it could scald your in insides, which is why hot drinks or hot soup would have been in that same ring or hot chocolate. And so the fact that they're misreading the temperance movement into this, it just shows that it's, it's not revelation, and it's it's just it's. The way they the way they redefine it, which I guess we'll get to on the next slide, it just tells us that they don't know, or at least they're not getting any information that we couldn't get on our own. Yeah. So let's go to the next slide. And so for me, one of the the the, the best ways to know that this is not from God is what we mentioned earlier, is that we there's no thing in here that's unknown at the time, especially the idea of boiling water. And if you read the Saints book in chapter 19 of the first Saints book. Uh, there's a cholera outbreak outbreak that happens, and it sickens over 60 members of the church, and over a dozen early members of the church die from it. This outbreak happened the year after the Word of Wisdom was recorded. And like I said, what better way to know that Joseph Smith was receiving real revelation from God than to learn such a basic necessity such as boiling their water before consuming it, which not only would have helped the, the church, but it would have helped the world. Let's be honest. This would have been something that would have been not only big for the church, but it would have been a huge um, way to get people to join the church, be able to say, Hey, we found out this thing that'll keep you from getting sick. And we didn't know it until him. And it's just to re to reiterate this, every concept in the word of wisdom was known to Joseph Smith through outside movements, such as the temperance movement, yet the most important revelations that we could have known, uh, such as boiling water were left unsaid. And for me, that's a red flag because just like the book of Mormon, every revelation stops the moment the book of Mormon is being written and the word of wisdom, every, um, idea of what is called a health code is dated to the moment it was written and not for the latter days, not for the church today. This is for the 1830s because it's limited to what the 1830s knew. Yeah. And that's just so profound. Why does God care about, I mean, now we're going to get to this, but like now we know that many people say coffee and tea is actually healthy. So why, why have we been avoiding, yep. why was it so important for God to give us this ambiguous revelation in these arcane or archaic words that don't even make sense to us so yep. that then we're avoiding a couple beverages that are actually healthy for us, substituting them with super unhealthy um, beverages like Diet Coke and all the chemicals and in, in, yep. in soda and monster drinks, et cetera. And then he's completely forgetting some of the actual dietary things, you know, let's, let's agree. Like smoking causes yeah. cancer. That's a hit. That's a win. Tobac yep. Tobacco causes mouth cancer. That's a win. But, but coffee and tea, is that a win? And and why in the fetch didn't God, you know, tell us things like boiling water, germ theory, other things would have been made way more important. Yeah, I agree. I mean, that's just right. it. it's, it's inconsistent. Okay. All right. So uh, next next slide is, did the word of wisdom warn of substance abuse? Yeah. yeah. So the video really goes hard. It's saying that the word of wisdom is warning against substance abuse. And it's really convenient to say that, but one has to remember in Joseph Smith's time, 
they believed the world was ending in a matter of years. The, re- the, the reference in the Word of Wisdom to the consequence of evils and designs which do and will exist in the hearts of conspiring men in the last days has to be taken in that context, that they believed they were in those last days. They're not specifically referring to substances 200 years later because they believe the world is going to be over in 200 years. They believe the second coming is happening you know, within the next 40, 50 years. I think Joseph Smith had that one revelation. If he lived to like 86, it would happen. And uh, a lot of the patriarchal blessings at the time said that they'd live long enough to see Jesus. They believed fully that the world was going to be done and the second coming was going to happen before 1900. So this is another area where they are imposing into this revelation um, things that not only are not there, but things that are kind of contradicted against by looking at the text in the context of the revelation, um, because this revelation is very, very, very boxed into an 1830s mindset. Yeah, absolutely. Which which fits the model of Joseph Smith importing things from his you know surrounding influences. Yeah. And so this oh, one, yeah, this one's mind blowing to me. Yeah, this one, this one shows, well, two things. One is the word of wisdom says beer is okay. So from DNC 89, it says, nevertheless, wheat for man and corn for the ox and oats for the horse and rye for the fowls and for the for swine and for all beasts of the fields and barley for all useful animals and for mild drinks as also other grain. So this is literally saying that mild drinks are okay as barley is used, you know, primarily for beer. And I think some of the hard liquor actually uses, you know, grains as well. So whiskey, uh, whiskey. I mean, I guess that would not be considered mild drinks. I think beer would be considered more mild, but yeah, I mean, this is expressly saying that basically beer is okay, but lay off the hard stuff. And um, it matches because the church continued to drink for long after the word of wisdom was recorded. And so drink beer. Uh, yeah. So that's not to say that everyone in the church should start chugging beers on Sunday. I'm just pointing out that you'd be within the revelation of God to do so. And as we mentioned earlier, when we talk about the church whitewashing history, I want you to look on the right. If you're watching, if you're listening, I'll, I'll read it. But in Joseph Smith's personal journal from June 1st, 1844, it says, then went to John P. Green's and paid him another, paid him and another brother $200, drank a glass of beer at Moser's, called it William Clayton's. So he's saying he went and uh, dropped off $200 for somebody he owed money to, drank a glass of beer, and then he called it William Clayton's. Now, they're going to revise that history in 1902, and I want to read that to you and see if you notice anything missing. Then went to John P. Green's and paid him and another brother $200, called it William Clayton's. <laughs> so the church is removing that Joseph Smith drank beer because they don't want members to know he drank beer long That's after the word of wisdom was written. Smoking gun of deception. That's yeah, I mean. Egregious, outrageous yeah. lies. This is a lie. This is intentionally altering the history so that members don't realize Holy that. moly. Yeah, and this in 1902 just happens to be when the church starts really emphasizing the word of wisdom. So isn't it convenient that you change the history just as Joseph Smith did when he changes revelations, when he changes foundational stories, the church after Joseph Smith is doing the exact same thing because now that in 1902, they're going to make the word of wisdom a very high emphasis, they need to go back and change the history. And that's exactly what they do. Yeah. And again, you just made this point, but like you could fault them for doing that, except that they're only doing what they learned from Joseph. <laughs> yeah, this is what's been done since since the start of the church. But if you don't it, like the historical record, rewrite it. <laughs> yep, and just make sure you try to make sure that people don't realize it. But yeah, it's it's just it's a bad rewrite it, and then it's bad. Punish anyone who mentions it. You know. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's deny yeah. it, rewrite it, deny it, and then punish anyone who talks about it. And, and the thing is, and I don't want to go too far on this, but the problem is, and we talked about this with Joseph Smith in the last few weeks. Once you show that they're willing to intentionally deceive people by changing, by altering, by creating new stories, you then it's hard to trust anything they say. It would be like if you, uh, if your if your spouse suspected you of cheating, and you're like, no, I wasn't out with another woman. I was at a work meeting at a restaurant, and then they found out you were at a, a bar or you were at someone's house, and you go, I wasn't actually cheating. I just went out to a bar. That person's not going to trust the other stuff you say because you've already shown you're willing to lie to cover your tracks. So I'm not saying that this shows the church is lying about every little thing about the church. I'm just saying you now know they are more than willing to alter their history in order to keep members from understanding what really happened. We showed that with Joseph Smith. We've shown that with um, the priesthood in the first vision last few weeks of these episodes. We've shown that on how they've removed um, some of the references to treasure digging or they kind of reframe it. And this is another instance where the church after Joseph Smith is more than willing to alter their own history so that you don't know what happened. Totally. Okay. The next slide is the word of wisdom, a credible health code. 
yeah, this is just one. We already kind of hinted at it, and so we don't need to go too far. But it's just to say it's a very inconsistent revelation when you read it at face value. And so today we're kind of taught that it's like this really consistent, clean, and prophetic health code. And it just doesn't really work that way because, as you said earlier, there are study after study showing that there are a lot of health effects of uh, mild coffee and tea consumption. And on the flip side, we can show that coffee is way healthier than um, soda or pop. And um, BYU now proudly serves Coke. And uh, you can go to anywhere. And I've never been to Utah, actually, but you could see all the videos of people from Utah going to, you know, there's like a soda shop on every corner. Um, you can also see all of the people that are in the church who drink Red Bulls and Monster Energy drinks, which are way unhealthy compared to coffee and tea. And so while p- people will say, oh, well, Joseph Smith knew that drinking alcohol was bad. Well, yeah, and that's good. But again, a lot of people at the time knew that. They knew it was bad because they saw how it made people act and they saw how it could basically dehabilitate people that had a problem with alcohol. Same thing with with smoking. They could see uh, the smoke smelled horrible. It was disgusting. And so a lot of the the, the hits that people claim are good, but then you also have to address the fact that there's misses. And when you're, when your batting average is still at best, say 500, that's not really a prophet seer and revelator. That's what anyone else in that time frame was doing in the temperance movement. So it's just to say it's inter- inconsistent. It's contradictory. And then when you look at the way the revelation was written compared to how it is today, there's no way to reconcile it all in a way that makes it seem like it's logical from God, who again, could see that the lost 116 pages would be lost and create a second set of plates who we are told could could know thousands of years ago that Joseph, son of Joseph, was going to translate the Book of Mormon and yet can't give us a word of wisdom in a way that makes sense in 2020 or even in like 1900. And so all of that combined with the fact that there's no unknown deals details such as bo- boiling water, all of this is a huge tell that this is not a credible health code, nor is it a revelation from God. All right. Makes sense. Next slide is the church did not make the word of wisdom a commandment until 1919. And this is something that Mormons are not told. Yeah, this is something I certainly wasn't aware of. Generally speaking. Yeah, generally speaking. And so the the church did not require the word of wisdom to be obeyed as a temple requirement question until 1919. And I believe in 1902, uh, they began making it more of an emphasis. So I think in 1902, there was kind of like that open idea that you could be rejected for it. And I think in 1919, it was the first year it was an actual temple recommend question. And, you know, the thing is the word of wisdom itself specifically goes out of its way to tell you it's not a commandment. It says to be sent by greeting, not by commandment or constraint. So until 1851, um, it wasn't considered a commandment. And then Brigham Young started to kind of come down on people who were abusing it in bad ways. Like if you were drunk a lot and all of that. Um, Brigham Young, though, owned and profited from the Salt Lake City Distillery. Um, church members continued to drink and smoke for 70 years after the revelation was recorded. And that's why we're left with a revelation. Not, not just church members, but actual apostles. Yeah, leaders. Yep. Prophets the leaders. and revelators continued to, you know, smoke, drink, alcohol, tobacco, coffee, tea, etc. Yep. Yeah. I mean, so it was it was widespread use. And, it, you know, it's just to point out that this was not adhered to. Uh, by the, even the leaders of the church until you got to the 1920s when it became a temple recommend question. And, you know, it's just, um, to me, it's an interesting thing. And I know it lines up really well with prohibition. Um, I've heard, you know, back and forth as to to why that is. And we'll get to more of that later. But yeah, I mean, we're talking 80 years basically before this is considered, 80 plus years before this is a temple recommend question. And it's just not the way it's taught today because, you know, it, this is not a commandment. It, it literally says it's not a commandment, but yeah. just kind of like a warning or, or like a, a guideline. Yeah. And on the one hand, I think I can hear Mormons and Mormon apologists saying, well, that's a feature, not a bug. The Mormon church believes in ongoing revelation. And if Joseph Smith says that it's, you know, just uh, not by way of commandment, but just, you know, by, uh, you know, by suggestion, but then a future prophet changes it. You should always pay attention to the most current prophet because God is, you know, it's a, it's an ongoing unfolding restoration and God, you know, will change things depending on the time and sometimes he'll improve things. So, you know, on the one hand, that's what I think the church is going to say. On the other hand, um, Jesus, freaking Jesus, the son of God drank wine for heaven's sakes, right? Yeah. It's like Joseph Smith drank wine the night before he was martyred. What the fetch, why in the fetch would it be something that would keep you 
out of the temple, which keeps you from gaining the ordinances that you need for salvation, including your endowment, your washings and anointings, including your temple marriage, including the temple marriages of your siblings or your children, your own children, why would it be, you know, elevated to something that literally means spiritual life and death if Jesus and Joseph themselves partook in all those things? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, it yeah. doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. And, you know, I've joked before um, that, you know, Jesus couldn't, um, he would be uh, reported for honor code violations at BYU because he had a beard, he drank. I mean, it's just. He wore it, sandals. He yeah. wore sandals. It's just, it's silly. And I, the thing is, like, you know, um, you just, you look at the way you know, what you said about the apologetics and they'll say, you're right. They'll say, we believe in ongoing revelation. And my response would be, then where's the revelation? Why couldn't the leaders not say, you know, I received a revelation. Um, I wrote it down on the yellow pad as Russell Nelson claims. And it said, you know, my beloved, you know, me, you know, servant. Um, I don't know. I can't remember who, who was the, the prophet when they first started doing it, but um, you know, uh, the time has now come for, um, my previous revelation to be a commandment. Um, you have now had plenty of time to prepare, to prepare for this because I know one of the arguments is that, you know, when they came up with the word of wisdom, a lot of the people were drinking and smoking and it was too much to ask of them to give that up. Even though they ask that when missionaries come to people's doors, asking you to convert and give up your coffee, tea, smoking, all that. And, and so I guess I would just say, it's like one of those things like, where, where's the paper trail? Cause this just comes out of thin air as far as um, the reinterpretation of it. Why is there not another revelation? Why don't they change DNC to, to fit it then? I mean, I just, I feel like it's a great apologetic. It just doesn't work when you look at the pattern of how this stuff has happened before with Joseph Smith. They're, they're just pulling this one out and redefining it in a way, as we'll talk about later, that really takes it away from being a law of health and more just of a law of obedience because there are healthy things that the church is forbidding and a lot of unhealthy things that the church seems fine with. And it's just inconsistent. Yeah. It's inconsistent. And that inconsistency has caused a lot of pain and suffering over the years. Yes. And yeah. you hear stories. Um, it might be John Larson. I think he could do a, uh, I think one of his episodes, it might be him, might be someone else. And they did their mission in Japan. And they were saying, oh, people in Japan drink tea. And so you're going to these people and tell them to join your church. And they're like, well, I don't want to give up tea. And it's like, well, you have to, because this is the rule. And I mean, it's just unnecessary because like, there's so many health benefits to tea to tell someone they're not worthy of being in the temple because of that. It's just, it's silly. And it's, um, it, again, it just shows that this is not something coming from God or it shows that God is really inconsistent and not a good, uh, or, or a measure of health. Or I guess you might have some people say, which I've also heard that in time science is always wrong. So in time we'll see that coffee and tea are actually really dangerous, but Again, I, I don't think that's an argument you would make unless you had to to defend a policy of the church. Yeah, I just think it makes zero sense that early church leaders were and Jesus himself. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. Wine or, and or using tobacco, and yet an investigator in Chile who's just learning about the church is going to be prevented from baptism because he has a cup of coffee, which is completely healthy and yep. culturally appropriate. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and in some ways, the only way to get clean water, right? <laughs> yeah, that's another thing. I mean, I know today in America, we're blessed that we don't have to worry about that. But there are third world countries where drinking coffee is a good way to make sure you get rid of any of that stuff. And yet in the church, you're being told you can't do that. And also that you need to pay tithing to get out of poverty. It's just, I should have thrown that last dig in. But yeah, it's just, it's the inconsistency of it, the way that it just, it, it's not logical. And I think at some point, I mean, I would not be surprised if at some point this this is relaxed off the temple recommend because younger younger members of the church, you see them all the time online, drinking coffee, um, drinking iced coffee, not wearing garments. I mean, there are things in the church that they're losing a little bit of control over, and I would not be surprised to see them loosen this. But until then, yeah, it's very inconsistent. Coffee shops are popping up all over Provo, and yeah, yeah BYU students are there all the time. There, there's a reason, they're yeah. Coffee, they're getting coffee, but they're calling it hot chocolate. Yeah. I've seen a lot of people online who are drinking coffee, and people will reply to them online and say, "You're you're Mormon, you can't do that." And they say, "No, this one's between me and God. I don't have to, you know, I have to tell my bishop about it." I'm like, "Yeah, which that's true. <laughs> it is not between you and your bishop, but you're just seeing that this is I'm, not sustainable." I'm also going to say that I know at least one former you know, general slash area authority in modern times, let's just say in the past 20 to 30 years, 
who drank alcohol as a general slash area authority. Yeah. And I know this because, you know, family members of his told me that yeah. and so there's, there's this kind of unwritten kind of separate set of rules that the more wealthy or elite Mormons live by where they know that what they drink in the privacy of their own homes is their business yep. and, and they get to play by separate rules, you know? Yeah. And you know, yeah, it goes. And like I said, I've seen, I, I know people who drink alcohol and they do it in a way that they justify as like being a medical thing to help them sleep or to help them, you know, people get around it. Like, Oh, if I have a glass of wine, it's, it's, it's necessary to help me sleep. It's like, yeah, okay, sure. Well, like you said, beer is explicitly allowed. I know everyone, like I said, everyone on, you know, should grab a beer. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I've had it like once in my life and I thought it tasted disgusting, but that's probably because I was raised not to drink it. And so after I, yeah, it, I didn't like it, but that being said, I probably should because it's, it's totally allowed. And I, I would be more um, in with the word of wisdom than a lot of other people. So, you know, for, and for know. the record, I've never tried any form of tobacco or alcohol in my life and I'm 53. Yeah. That's just me. So, I, you know, and the thing is, and we don't need to get on a tangent about this, but you mentioned diet Co or Coke earlier. So I've got, I've got diet Coke in here because I have developed this insane sweet tooth uh, as part of being in the Mormon church, because you can't drink coffee, which is bitter. You can't drink beer, which is bitter. And so I never tried beer until after I'd kind of lost belief and we were at a work function and someone kept asking me. And so finally I just, I took it and I took a sip. I'm like, this is disgusting. And so I'm carrying it around with me and I don't want to drink it because it's gross. <laughs> and um, yeah. and that, yeah, that was pretty much the beginning and the end of that. I know a lot of people say it's acquired and it's not really important to this episode, but yeah, it is funny that um, being in the church and not being able to drink coffee and stuff, it really does make a lot of people have more of a sweet tooth, which is why you see those soda shops everywhere. And uh, that's not a great thing. I, I kind of wish I, I did drink coffee because I think it would be a lot healthier for me than drinking Coke. So yeah. So, yeah. And I, and I, you I hope you don't get to this, but given the, given the massive, you know, like, like heart disease in the United States, yeah kills infinitely more people than probably any drug, certainly more than marijuana, coffee, or tea, and probably more yeah. than even tobacco. And and yet there's nothing in here about, about refined sugars, yep. nothing about saturated fats, nothing yep. about cheeseburgers, nothing about French fries, nothing about, you know, hydrogenated vegetable oil, or, yep. you know, how amazing would that have been if Joseph had received a revelation about saturated fats and, and uh, you know, hydrogenated oils uh, or, or even cheeseburgers and French fries or yeah. milkshakes long, long, long before those words even came into our vernacular. Yep. Or don't use pesticides on your crops or, you yeah, know, yeah. you know, just, you could go on all day. And that's the problem yeah. is everything is completely in an 1830s mindset. There's nothing else in, yeah. It, it, we're beating a dead horse, but it's yeah. for a good reason because you have to illustrate just how dated this revelation is. The heart disease one itself is is just so significant. Yeah. Okay, let's go to the next slide, which is more video of what what the word of wisdom really serves as in Mormonism. This is Boyd K. Packer, my friend. But Latter Day Saints see the word of wisdom as more than just a health code. Adherence to the word of wisdom not only teaches members how to control appetites and guard their health is also part of what makes them eligible for temple worship and promises spiritual benefits. Most importantly, following the word of wisdom helps engender greater receptivity to personal revelation through the Spirit of the Lord. As Boyd K. Packer, an apostle of the Lord in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, once said, the fundamental purpose of the word of wisdom has to do with revelation. If someone under the influence can hardly listen to plain talk, how can they respond to spiritual promptings that touch their most delicate feelings? As valuable as the word of wisdom is as a law of health, it may be much more valuable to you spiritually than it is physically. So let's review. What is the word of wisdom and why is it important to Latter-day Saints? The word of wisdom is a revelation. In it, the Lord promises that those who follow his guidelines will have better health. But he also promises greater happiness, wisdom, and spiritual blessings too. Most of all, the word of wisdom shows us that God loves us. He wants us to be healthy and spiritually receptive to his words. Now you know. All right. Well, now we know. Yeah. I'm just going to say really quickly, obviously, we've already talked about the fact that many of the early saints were on the, under the influence of alcohol when the Kirtland miracles happened. So obviously... Yeah. There's a problem with their statement that you can't have spiritual experiences 
when you're under the influence of some of these things, certainly coffee and tea aren't going to keep you from having spiritual experiences or I yeah. even tobacco. I'm also just going to say that for my friends that have tried psychedelics, uh, you know, especially magic mushrooms or peyote or ayahuasca, they all universally tell me that psychedelics have provided them with the most spiritually uplifting experiences of their life, hands down. And so I just think that's flatly wrong, what they just said in that article. Yeah, it's just, like I said, it's just so inconsistent. It, it doesn't add up. It doesn't match what the reality is. And these are, you know, and Boyd K. Packer in his quote is, um, you know, again, an ordained, you know, prophet, seer, and revelator. And he's just saying stuff that just doesn't line up with what the text of the word of wisdom is and the utilization of it. it you know, to what you said earlier, like coffee makes you more receptive to what you're doing. I mean, there, to, I can't tell you the times you're people drinking coffee at night because they have to get a project done for school or to, to, to focus. I know people, actually, I know people who are Mormon who get coffee when they do road trips because it helps them focus on the road because they want to make sure that they stay awake and alert. So I would argue in a lot of ways that helps you focus a lot more um, than maybe drinking a crap ton of uh, sugary drinks would do. And, um, and, and I think that really gets down to the point of it, which is this is just not at this point, a law of health. It's, it's, it's a law of obedience. It's about, getting members to rally around something that is something that requires you to do something you might not want to do to stick out a little bit and, um, you know, to kind of obey the leaders of the church in order to get the the prize, which is, you know, um, the endowment and, you know, your temple recommend. Yeah. All right. So what is the word of wisdom then, if it's not necessarily a health code given by revelation? Yeah. And so we've kind of hit all these points at this point, but at the end of the day, we have health studies showing coffee and tea have tons of benefits and we have no consistency when it comes to banning coffee because it's a hot drink, but then also banning iced coffee as a cold drink um, because the word of wisdom is really clear uh, that you can not have hot drinks, but it has nothing about cold drinks and it's not about caffeine. So it just shows there's just the subjectiveness about how it's being used that is just not really consistent or logical and and to that point it, it kind of to me screams that since the 1919 being a temple recommend question really shows that this is about a law of obedience and you know um we'll get to it a little bit but i think there's reasons why they went hard on that when they did and i think it's just about you know again being willing to obey what the what the leaders want you to do and um you know it's a lot of times they'll say it's it's not about, you know, us. It's not about, it's about you being willing to sacrifice for God. And I think this is another instance where it makes no sense from a logical standpoint, except that it's keeping you in tune with what the leaders want you to do, which of course is in their minds, what God wants you to do. But of course, that's always through the filter of the leaders. Yeah. And this is always a difficult area to try, but I, I think it's important to mention Stephen Hassan is the world's uh, expert in cults or high demand religions. And he has put together what he calls the BITE model, which is an acronym to represent uh, signs of a high demand religion or a cult. Because nobody who's in a cult thinks they're in a cult. They just think they're in the one true way or in a really great organization or God's true church. But the B in the BITE model stands for behavior. Whenever a organization or religion starts controlling your behavior in unreasonable or excessive ways, whether it's how you dress, whether it's the words you use, whether it's the food you eat, whether it's, you know, particulars around your sexuality, that's, those are warning signs that you're, that you're the member of, of a cult or a high demand religion. And if you, if you go to any, any high demand religion or cult, you will find very, very strict health codes or could controls or rules around food in addition to dress and sex and language and so forth. And so that's not to say that the Mormon church is a cult because it prohibits coffee and tea. It is to say that, uh, you know, when the church starts saying that the word of wisdom is a sign of obedience and not so much health, that's when it starts to veer into control, un unnecessary control territory that I think gets it, you know, gets it in, in kind of that high demand religion or cult territory. That's just how I feel. Yeah. I mean, you know, for me, when I joined, I was still getting out of high school, so I wasn't drinking coffee. Um, I kind of wanted to, because that was right around the age when a lot of people did. And then when you go to college and all that, 
but it wasn't like a huge deal because I wasn't already drinking it. And so that wasn't a huge deal. But then it's like you compound that with, you know, um, going through the temple and I did not know you had to wear church required underwear. So then all of a sudden you're like, okay, so they're telling you what you can and can't eat. They're telling you what you have to wear. They're telling you how you have to spend your money. And that stuff does add up, you know, a lot of these things. And, um, you know, one of the things that I think is, um, a characteristic of not just what Joseph Smith did, but what the church does today is it's always like, if we can get you to do this, we can get you to do that. And I'm not saying it's evil. I'm just saying, if we can get you not to drink coffee and tea and we can get you to give us 10% of your income, then we can get you to wear garments, uh, church required underwear at the temple. And then we, you know, and when you talk about polygamy, well, then we can get you to enter into polygamy because it's always one step further. And I'm not saying that's necessarily what it is. I just feel like there are a lot of um, steps of obedience you have to take that don't really make sense. And then all of a sudden, when you start doing them, it's a lot easier to keep doing them because you're like, well, I'm already in this far. I might as well keep going. And and that is an element of high demand religions in order to keep you loyal to the church. And um, we'll get to it in a few minutes, but this is something that becomes a huge um, concern of the church after polygamy has ended. And it almost feels like polygamy was a rallying cry for the church until it had to end, at least for, for now. And then the word of wisdom comes in as a rallying cry, as a thing that makes you unique and that you have to obey to. And I do feel like there are elements of the church that want that need for obedience because it keeps you more loyal to the church. If you were allowed to wear your own underwear, if you were allowed to drink coffee and tea, it would be a little easier to step away because you don't have a structure that you're so tied to. And I, I don't know if I'm phrasing this in the best way. I'm just saying that because you make it a law of obedience, and I'm not saying the church phrases that way, they, they, but they do emphasize it's not really as much about health as about you being able to hear the spirit. So it does feel like it's more about like, you need to obey this so you can be a better member in the church. And I do feel like it does allow right. um, behavior patterns that link you to the church even stronger. And it becomes over time, a very important identity marker. Yes. We can have an us versus them kind of mindset as a way to make members feel like they're different, a peculiar people yep. in some ways, a better, better people than, than their neighbors, you yeah. know, the bad people who drink and smoke, which is super common in the Mormon context. Okay. Yep. What is this document bill of particulars for me? So this is a, a bill of particulars that each family was supposed to take when they traveled from Nauvoo to Utah. And you'll just notice that every member was, was told to bring coffee and tea with them. And it's just funny because with the word of wisdom, you would think there'd be no reason to do that. And yet, you know, here we are. And so they do also tell you to bring a gallon of alcohol but that could very well be for for cleaning. I don't I don't know. So I didn't want to highlight that one because I'm not entirely sure if that alcohol. You know, you don't drink straight alcohol. I don't think anyone did. But um, I doubt they had isopropyl alcohol on the planes. But maybe yeah, I, I doubt it too. So I'm trying to give benefit of the doubt. So, but either way, you're at least being told to bring tea and coffee in 1845, which just again shows that at this point, um, you know, the word of wisdom was just not being obeyed in the way we're expected to obey it today. And I think that's worth noting because of the fact that. You know, they're literally told to use what little amount of space they had to pack stuff with to bring coffee and tea. Yeah, that's really interesting and really important. And so, okay, so now we are now we get to my favorite part of the yeah. apologetics. Yeah. So some apologists argue the reason it was not considered a temple recommend question until 1919 or a big focus until 1902 was because church members needed time to get away from the addiction of these substances. But like I said, we this is you know almost 90 years between when it was recorded and when it became a hard temple recommend question. So anyone using these substances when the revelation was recorded would have been long gone. And so beyond that, you know, we've got Brigham Young uh, declaring it as a commandment in 1851. And a lot of people will say, well, see, it was, you know, it was already a commandment in 1851. It just wasn't enforced as much. But you know, if you want to use Brigham Young as the, you know, being so basically saying he was making a prophetic call here to make it a commandment, then you also have to then look at, you know, the other things that Brigham Young declared as a prophet, such as the ban on those with black skin, Adam, God, blood atonement. And those are things the church wants no part of. So it is kind of that way that they sometimes cherry pick with Brigham Young to say, see, Brigham Young was teaching this, this amazing idea. And then when you mention all of the other ideas he taught that are disavowed today, they kind of run from it. And so it's just the consistency of, of using Brigham Young as one of your sources here. It's a, it's also a dumb argument because why didn't Joseph Smith live the higher law? Was he not ready yet? Yeah, exactly. Jesus Christ himself. Why didn't he live the higher law? Why is he drinking wine? Was he not enlightened enough yet? He was supposed to be a perfect human. And yeah, so it's just 
that yeah. makes no sense. That's a it, dumb apologetic argument. It's why it, I it's, hate Mormon apologists. Well, uh, in that, that, I, I hate, hate apologists. I hate Mormon apologetic arguments. I think they're dumb. Yeah, I hate the argument too because I again, it's like by that logic, do they tell people who want to join the church, yeah, you can take twenty years to get off? No, they're like you have to stop drinking, you have to stop smoking, you have to stop, um, you know, drinking tea and coffee. Yeah, and it's just it, you know, it's just inconsistent. I, I I've I've said it so many times through these episodes. I hate inconsistencies. That's why I hate the loose, loose versus tight stuff when you jump between the two because it's like you pick a lane and go with it. And if you want to go with this this idea that you know it took 90 years to get used to it i just i feel like you're opening up more problems and it just the, the data itself would tell you that you don't need that long i mean most people were dead so you know they yeah it, it's it's and nonsense it's and it's important whenever we note a problematic change that we can always find a historical reason for why the change was made and that's yep. to the next slide what led to the decision to make the word of wisdom a commandment yeah and so i mentioned this earlier but you know one other element that to me would make sense as to why this being kind of a law of obedience is that the word of wisdom became a requirement for temple recommends shortly after the church released their second manifesto on polygamy. And this caused a lot of uproar because imagine that you went into the new and everlasting covenant of polygamy and you took plural wives and um, you, maybe you are a polygamous wife and you're like, I did this for nothing. You know what I mean? And, and so there is a lot of, I, I would imagine there'd be a lot of hard feelings by people who basically realize they could have had, a marriage of actual love and, and, and instead they're married to a dude that's 30 years older than them who can't take care of them. And so a lot of the, to me, the timing of the word of wisdom being more of a focus in 1902 and then a temple recommend in 1919 kind of seems like maybe it was something that the church leaders were trying to get members to rally around. And as you said earlier, identify themselves with. And I, I think a lot of people say prohibition and that could be the reason it was really clamped down on because prohibition starts in January, 1919 and a letter on October 8th, 1919 from the first presidency makes it a temple worthiness requirement. And so um, it does make sense that they were trying to line up with prohibition and basically saying, see, we were doing this anyways. Now there's prohibition. We're going to make it official because you can't drink in the U S anyways. But I think because they made it a focus around 1902, it lines up also with the fact that, they needed some identity markers because they were losing such a big one with polygamy. And I think those two things really led to the decision to go from it being kind of like a loosely enforced revelation to a temple recommend question that was a strict commandment. Yep. Um, and that makes sense. Yeah. And, and it, it, when you read, when you read did, uh, Gregory Prince's David O. McKay and the rise of modern womanism, and I'm sure there are others that pointed this out. Prior to David O. McKay, there was kind of a look between Joseph Smith and David O. McKay. There was kind of this look of a Mormon prophet. It was, you know, long beard, older, uh, yep. frontier looking guy. And they were pretty much all, um, almost all of them were polygamists. Yeah. That was, you know, that was, that was the mark. That was the brand of, of Mormon prophets and of Mormons. But once you lose, once you lose polygamy um, and once you have to get rid of that and once you're entering into the modern era and you're going to try and change your brand, which I think is literally a, a, a fair way to describe what happened, you're going to need a new appearance. You're going to need an updated appearance and probably an updated emphasis on the things that you're going to emphasize. Yeah. You're not going to be emphasizing that you're not polygamists. So what yeah. are you going to be emphasizing? you know, we kind of become McDonald's, IBM, you know, all American Donnie Marie Osmond, uh, sort of people like home, like R Richard Cunningham, happy days, Beaver and Wally Cleaver, uh, Stepford wives, kind of 1950s America. That's what our new brand becomes and being squeaky clean in terms of like alcohol and drugs and tobacco and short hair and no beard, that becomes the new Mormon brand, and it pretty much starts with David O. McKay, and then it continues forward. But it but it also starts with the end of polygamy. Yeah, that's I mean, a really the, important observation. Yeah, it's a big transition period for them because they're trying to find. I mean, you lose one of the main things you're rallying around, and you have to find other things to hold on to. And I honestly think that has as much to do with this prohibition because it really does. It's around 1902 when they start making, they start rejecting people. Um, for temple recommends at that point, but it appears 1919 is when it was a firm question. And so 
And again, that's I, so fascinating that just like the temperance movement yep. sort of was the impetus to the 18 yeah. whatever, 30, whatever revelation, it was the prohibition movement that, that was the impetus to the making it the word of wisdom is a command. Yeah. Nothing, you know, it's one of those things that and I think I mentioned the slide and didn't say it, but nothing seems to alter church policy and doctrine more than outside events. You know, the same yeah. thing with the 1978 yeah. lifting of the ban. It was because at yeah. some point it becomes socially unacceptable. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, changing the introduction to the Book of Mormon came across because, you know, DNA events told them that the Book of Mormon's claims were, were not backed up by science. And so, yeah, it's outside events are the greatest, uh, the, the thing that leads to the most revelation is, is when you have outside pressure. It's the same thing with the November 2015 policy. That was revelation according to Russell Nelson and three and a half years later, because the social pressure was just so strong and the member, the young members especially were not having it. God gave Russell Nelson another revelation to remove it. And yeah, it's, it's just it, it, every time you can, you can see the fingerprints, you can see the path that these things taken. They're very common threads across all of them. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so uh, next slide is compare the words of the Word of Wisdom versus today's use. Yeah, and so we just want to kind of look at how the Word of Wisdom declares basically health status or health data points. So they say, wine and other strong drinks should not be used except in the case of the sacrament as well as the washing of the body. So obviously that's been changed because there's no more wine uh, used for the sacrament. Uh, tobacco should not be used by men, but as an herb for bruises in all sick cattle. I'd like you to, I mean, I've, I've asked this before and I, some people swear that they do use tobacco for uh, bruises and for sick cattle. And I have just not seen that as any kind of a, uh, you know, best practice kind of a thing. Um, hot drinks, which would mean soup, hot chocolate, coffee, and tea are not for the body or belly. And again, think of how it's used today. They declare that as coffee and tea, but you can drink hot chocolate. You can eat hot soup. Um, you can eat hot stews. I mean, all of these things that are kind of liquidy, hot things are herbal tea. More herbal tea is okay. Yeah. Or, so yeah. it's, it's very, very inconsistent. Um, all herbs and fruits are ordained to be used by God and should be used with prudence. And so my friends want to say that cannabis should be. Yeah. I note that. Yeah, it's true. Wisdom. Yeah. I mean, it's true. It, and that's the thing, you know, right there is telling mushrooms. you mushrooms are organic. Yep. Right. Yeah, I mean, so basically what this what this revelation is saying is if it's growing, uh, it's from God and should be used with prudence. And so, you know, that's I say at the end, you know, isn't marijuana an herb? And it is. And um, meat is to be eaten sparingly only in times of winter or of cold or famine. We and know that was ridiculous because more yeah. heavy, heavy, heavy meat eaters. Yeah, certainly not only eating meat in times of winter, cold or famine. No, nope. I just I just went to Maddox Steakhouse in Brigham City, Utah for my birthday last week. And there was literally a 45 minute wait. Yeah. And they were they were pretty much all Mormons there at Maddox. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean it's it's in the it's, middle of summer, right? So why you, you is know, that not keeping people out of the temple? Why are all yeah. the people that eat meat not in winter or times of famine? Why aren't they all kept out of the temple? It's totally yeah, arbitrary. It is that's the thing. It's it's very subjective. Arbitrary is a good word. It's just it's rough. And all grain is to be used by both man and beast and barley for all useful animals and for mild drinks, beer, and also as also other grain. And so, you know, by the wording of DNC 132, the church should allow any iced coffee or iced tea drinks, beer or wine for the sacrament. Furthermore, as I said a number of times now, this is being written without any foresight or profile knowledge. It doesn't mention boiling water. It doesn't mention uh, overabundance of sugary foods. It doesn't mention anything about energy drinks that are going to stimulate your body. Uh, it doesn't mention that all foods should be taken out of, with moderation. And like we said, I mean, if you want to read this as the revelation is, as the word of God is, marijuana is an herb that apparently is ordained to be used by God with prudence. So on that I one, to the church's credit, apparently if marijuana use or cannabis use is legal in a state, I haven't heard of them going after people for using cannabis. I would love, kinda, I would, yeah. It's kind of new. What? what I, I was just going to say, I would love to see someone in a state uh, where it's legal, go to their, their temple recommend question and say, I've been using marijuana, whether it's smoking it or, you know, through gummies or brownies or whatever. You can tell I don't use it because I don't quite know the terminology well, but um, tell their bishop that and then have their bishop go, oh, you're cool. I'm telling oh, you right oh, now no, that's no, not happening. No. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. Uh, number one, I've never tried cannabis either. But number two, um, there are bishops that allow cannabis use. Really? It's just, but that's where Bishop Roulette comes well, in. Well, yeah, there is always that. The church doesn't dare um, state that publicly. 
And of course, they tried to fight and and beat down the cannabis legislation that Utah citizens passed. And they've, you know, in some ways made it really hard for people to even get cannabis. But but overall, if you get the right Mormon bishop, he's totally okay with cannabis use. I almost want to send an email to like church headquarters if I can find a good contact and just ask them. Yeah. Because I, I actually think I might just because I'm curious to see if I could get a response to that. Because I guarantee you that is not something that they would, would ever say out loud is okay. So I'm, I'm curious. I'm sure there's... If it's, I know for sure, I'm pretty sure that the church has made some sort of statement saying if it's prescribed by a doctor, well, yeah, that's legal, that's yeah, that's different. Then medical cannabis is okay. Yeah, I'm talking more like you know, in a lot of states now, it's recreational is, is legal. So I'm just curious on that because I, I guarantee I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to send him an email and just send him quote DNC 89, yeah, and say under, under the word of wisdom, this is allowed, and my state now has it legal for recreational use is this allowed? And, and I'm just curious to see, I, I know what they're going to say, but I'm, I just want to see it. Cause there's no way that's yeah. church policy whatsoever. There's no chance. Oh, the church doesn't like to have policies. No, that that's, that's 100% Bishop roulette. Cause I know there are a lot of bishops where people will say, I drink coffee and he's like, they don't, I don't care. That's fine. You know, I mean, I think a lot of bishops understand how but, unimportant but by, it is. But by not including it in the temple recommend questions, by not explicitly asking about marijuana, they're kind of, yeah, it's kind of a don't ask, don't tell. Well, they, yeah, and they did that when they changed that temple recommend question on garments, right? Because a lot, a lot of the young members are like, "Hey, it doesn't say I have to wear it day and night. It just says as I, as I promised in the temple." So they, they'll wear it when they go to church. They'll wear it when they go to temple, and then they're done. Which I think is a great thing. <laughs> I think garments are awful, but yeah. um, you know, you talk to a, a, a member who went through the temple with you know more than five or six years ago, and they'll tell you, "Oh, the real Mormons wear garments twenty four seven. So as we talked about earlier, it is definitely a, a culture identifying kind of thing. So anyways, yeah. yeah. Let's go to the next slide about yeah. vilifying abusers of the word of wisdom. I just, I, you know, I pointed this out earlier and I know it's splitting hairs. And so we don't have to spend much time on this. It's just when they talk about conspiring men with evil designs, it's just so cartoony and Disney-esque to put this image of these four guys smoking cigars with counting money. And I just, you know, again, they show at the beginning of this thing uh, that people um, who... We're at the school of prophets there smoking cigars, just looking so super scholarly. And and it's just this is how they speak of the 99 plus percent of the world that ignore the word of wisdom. You know, it's like I realize that they don't view everyone who's not in the church as conspiring evil designs and all that, but it just it feels like just such a cartoony us versus them thing. Yeah. And these videos are meant for I think, you know, I think they're meant for outsiders who just are curious, but I think they're more meant for members in the church who are looking for a library of videos to explain topics. And I just think it's such a crappy way to um, well, try, define other people. To me, there's something more insidious behind this slide that I thought you might mention. And that's that when you're the average Mormon growing up, you really, really do believe that people that smoke uh, tobacco or, or chew tobacco or drink alcohol or do drugs are bad people. Yeah. And, and I, I, I know that people are going to take umbrage at me saying that, but every one of our kids is like, oh, I don't know if I want uncle so-and-so over because he smokes and aren't yep. people who smoke bad. You know, I remember when my, my oldest sister married a non-member, she was a smoker at the time. And then she marries a non-member who also was a smoker. And then once she stopped smoking, he kept smoking. And it was always a thing we talked about. It was like maybe never to his face, but yeah. behind his back. It's like, does, does he still smoke? He still smokes. Oh, well. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and we view people who drink, you know, as being partiers and as being, you know, drunkards and people who do drugs as druggies and stoners. And even more importantly, we view ourselves as better than other people that partake in those things. And it literally is just an identity way to feel superior. Well, yeah. I, if any, if any Mormon argues with me about that being the common Mormon view, I, I would be willing to have that conversation. No. And, and I actually get it because when I joined the church, my mom still smoked and obviously they weren't members. And I remember hearing it in church when they would talk about, Oh, you know, when you don't obey the word of wisdom, you can't get the goodness of God. You can't feel the spirit. You can't. And I just remember it killed me because I'm like, no, I know my mom's a good person and that does not change who she is as a person. Yeah. Obviously I didn't like it because I was afraid it was going to cause health issues for her. But at the same time, I didn't think less of her as a person 
Yeah. I just didn't like it because I was afraid. And, 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 you know, um, the church will come out and they'll say, listen, what we're talking about right here, that's culture. That's not us. But then this is a video produced by the church. And so you want to say, it's not us. It's the, it's just the culture, but then it's right in their videos. It's and again, this is, spoken, this is spoken at general conference, right? Yeah. And this one, I think a lot of people, if, if you're involved in listening to podcasts or stuff, you've seen this, but this is from uh, Julie Beck, I believe a uh, general conference. And she's talking about what happens when you drink a cup of coffee. And I and think these talks are pre-approved by, yeah, these, by yeah. the committee. So yeah, this, yeah, this approved by the church. This is not someone going rogue. This is fully approved as a way to tell people what happens when you drink a cup yeah. of coffee. So it seems outrageous and it's totally true. Yeah. She was the daughter of faithful pioneer parents who had sacrificed much for the gospel. She'd been married in the temple and was the mother of 10 children. She was a talented woman who taught her children how to pray, to work hard, and to love each other. She paid her tithing, and the family rode to the church together on Sunday in their wagon. Though she knew it was contrary to the word of wisdom, she developed the habit of drinking coffee and kept a coffee pot on the back of her stove. She claimed that the Lord will not keep me out of heaven for a little cup of coffee. But because of that little cup of coffee, she could not qualify for Temple Recommend. And neither could those of her children who drank coffee with her. She lived to a good old age, and she did eventually qualify to re-enter and serve in the Temple. But only one of her ten children had a worthy Temple marriage and a great number of her posterity, which is now in its fifth generation, live outside of the blessings of the restored gospel she believed in and her forefathers sacrificed so much for. That Man, that's some powerful coffee. It's keeping yeah. generations of people out of eternal salvation. I, what a crappy plan by Heavenly Father that he's going to keep his own children out of out of his own presence and out of their own salvation, basically condemning them to the Mormon equivalent of hell because someone's parents or grandparents drank coffee. It's so ridiculous. Yeah, it's uh it's the most emotionally manipulative crap you're gonna hear. And it's just one of those things because you've got, you know, I don't know how many people watch General Conference, a couple million who are watching that and they're watching it with their parents and these kids and they she has just the right timing on when she cries. I mean I, I know that's I think it's fake for a lot of people. I know some people think it's genuine and for some people it is. Some people are giving these stories and they do cry, but I feel like they practice this talk enough to where it's rehearsed. And um, it's just manipulative to tell these people, if you drink one cup of coffee, not only you're risking your own salvation, but you're going to destroy the the eternal happiness of, of everyone beneath you. And not only that, she makes sure to mention um, the the people that before their ancestors and how strong they were and how, you're effectively offending them. I just, it's, it's the most manipulative garbage. And, um, this is, you know, I think a microcosm of how the church uses a manip uh, emotional manipulation in their materials. And, you know, it's, uh, like you said, I mean, what kind of a plan, um, ba basically screws people for eternity because they drink a, a drink that's way healthier than a lot of the other stuff they could be drinking. It's just, you but, know, but, it, but it's real. Like in 2022, in 2022, if a faithful Mormon drinks coffee or tea, they will not be allowed and admits it. They will not be allowed to attend their own child's yeah. wedding. Yeah. I'm not exaggerating. They won't be able to attend a wedding. In yeah. 2022, if a if a Peruvian or a Brazilian or an African 20-year-old male or 8-year-old child wants to join the church, but they drink coffee, um, you know, because it's the only way for them to get sanitized water in the morning for a morning beverage. They will be denied baptism, and it's the most ridiculous thing on the planet. Well, yeah. not the most, but a, a it's not the most. But it, it's just it's yeah. it's silly, and yeah. you know, um, I've said in these overviews a lot. You know, I I don't want to make fun of this stuff. I don't want to present this stuff in a way that's mocking the beliefs of the church because I don't think that's helpful in any way. It's not constructive. And I'm not trying to make fun of this. I'm trying to point out the fact that this is truly emotionally manipulative and it's based off of a word of wisdom that never even mentions coffee. I, like all of this talk that she's talking about here 
is based on someone that is drinking coffee that's not mentioned the word of wisdom. I mean, maybe she's drinking iced coffee or, you know, it's just all of these things are just so inconsistent. And you're, you're telling, you're putting this fear into people that they're going to lose, not just their own salvation, but that they're going to destroy their, their kids' salvation or their grandkids. And in the process, you're going to lose your parents who were faithful. And it's just, it, it creates a lot of, um, stress where it doesn't need to be. And it's, it's just, it's based off of something that is, is as we've shown today is just not, not only is it just not illogical, but they're interpreting this revelation in a way that it was never meant to be in the first place. So she's yeah. telling people that they're going to, that, that her, she has now lost her salvation or no, she got it back. Cause she came back, but all of her kids now are not going to be with her in heaven because she drank a cup of coffee from a revelation that says it's not a commandment, but uh, by sent by greeting, like it's just, it, it's very, um, frustrating, but it also, you know, shows, I think how revelations and how policies and how all of this can function in the church and how it can be so, you know, troubling and, and, and painful for people. Yeah. Not to mention how in God's mind, letting Joseph Smith through whoever Heber J. Grant and all the members into the kingdom who all drank coffee, but then, you know, the ones decades later, yeah, well, Joseph drank coffee, but, but it wasn't a commandment at the time. But yeah. you drink coffee when it was a commandment, so you're out. But Joseph's in. Just yep. anyway, we're beating a dead horse. All right. We so are. here is the <laughs> here is the concluding slide. Yeah, and so you mentioned this at the start, but yeah, I don't think the word of wisdom is a smoking gun. I mean, if we're if we're ranking the problems of the church, it's certainly not going to be in the, at the very top of it by any stretch. But I think it again um, shows some of the elements of Joseph Smith's productions that we've talked about in the previous episodes, and that's why I think it's so important. So. Joseph Smith uses the surrounding ideas of the temperance movement to create a revelation from God that give his ideas more authority. We've talked about that with the priesthood restoration. We've talked about that with the Book of Mormon, all of that stuff, same kind of pattern here. Um, We talk about how Joseph Smith was able to create a revelation almost on request from Emma. So she says she's sick and tired of cleaning it. Um, According to the one account from David Whitmer, she says it would be awful nice if you get a revelation. He gets one like the next day. Um, The Mormon church has a very a uh, redefined explanation um, from a very clear revelation from God. And so they've redefined God's very clear statement that this is not a commandment, but sent by greeting. And so without having a second revelation to clarify the first, it does feel like they're just arbitrarily changing it. And when they arbitrarily change it, they're still showing that they have some of the same problems with the legitimacy of the claims made in the word of wisdom that they did back then. Um, which, you know, we've said before, you know, from a scientific nutritional standpoint, there are some serious problems with the word of wisdom, especially when you look at the fact that coffee and tea are healthy. Um, and yet we are allowed to drink sugary drinks. Um, like we've mentioned before, they don't talk about overeating on sugar. We've gone through it all. It's very inconsistent. And the final point, which is one that we see over and over again is everything Joseph Smith produces is limited to the knowledge he has at the time he's writing it. There is for someone who is, you know, proclaimed to be, you know, the greatest prophet since, you know, the time of Jesus, he has nothing um, that he prophesies on that wasn't known in his time and place um, that has been proven true. And it just shows us that he, you know, doesn't have any foresight. It doesn't have that channeling of a supernatural um, messenger that can can yeah. can warn us of, of anything coming up. And that continues to this day. And I think that pattern is one that at first, I think a lot of people just kind of go, that's not fair. Um, if we kind of look at some of the vague statements they made, we can attribute it here, but we can show over and over. And that pattern goes all the way to Russell Nelson, as we've talked about with, you know, COVID and, um, you know, the church not warning about 9-11, just stuff in our lifetimes. It, it's it's a consistent pattern where they don't know anything that's going to happen beyond today. Yeah, because if they're prophets, seers, and revelators now, even if the word of wisdom, DNC, one, DNC 89 is outdated, why why wouldn't they come up with an updated word of wisdom at a hundred exactly section 139 or 145 of the dnc and say behold i the lord have have unfolded a new word of wisdom and then gives it not only gives us the best advice for the day but even stuff that we wouldn't have been able to predict later anyway wonderful stuff mike thank you so much for preparing this uh it's been a wonderful episode And, and i should say We've got many more to come. Yeah. We've got, uh, we, you know, we've got race and race and Mormonism. 
the temple endowment and the mason masonry we've got polygamy multiple parts on polygamy book of abraham kinderhook plates spiritual witnesses and testimonies doubt revelations uh apologetics transfiguration of brigham young so so many cool episodes and if people want to request important episodes yeah. mike is willing to write some new essays to accommodate additional essays as well yeah and you know i'll just say now since we're heading into this part of the the episodes the next six episodes are going to be tough ones um we're going to be doing about race and the scriptures uh and then basically the five after that we've got the temple and then four on polygamy and i just want to say up front they're going to be really difficult they're going to be really tough uh, i think they're going to be ones that elicit emotional responses if you're a believer or a non-believer and so I just want to say we're going to do our best to make them as calm and neutral as we can. Mm -hmm. And I just like I, I guess I'm just giving a little bit of a trigger warning on those because I think those are going to be tough for me too because those are the areas where you can see some things that were done that are just really not good and do not line up with um, you know what you would expect. And so uh, you know buckle up because it's going to be really important episodes, but they're going to be really difficult. So hopefully um, we can all kind of get through them in a way that is constructive and, and helpful because I know that's my biggest concern with these is, is making them consumable to people who are going through where I was a few years ago and you you need um, the little bit of extra context and hopefully you need it done in a way that's not going to anger you or anger maybe someone who is still a believer and um, so we're going to do it as honest as we can but just as a warning these next six are going to be a little bit tougher as far as kind of maybe like the emotional response from them. All right. And, uh, you know, today's essay is ldsdiscussions.com slash W-O-W or WOW. You can find all these essays at ldsdiscussions.com. It's a great resource. Um, also, all these episodes have been consolidated uh, in Anchor, but also in Spotify. You can listen to them via Spotify and in Apple, the podcast app and wherever you get your audio podcasts and you can also watch them on video in spotify and you can watch them on youtube um uh, under the mormon stories podcast channel under the lds discussions youtube video playlist all this is included in the uh time codes and show notes along with any other links that we referenced today so mike you're awesome thanks so much keep up the thanks great everybody work. yep all right. see you guys next week and thanks to everyone for joining us today on Mormon Stories. We hope you enjoy this episode. Uh, we couldn't do this without your support, those of you who donate and make it happen. Also, the staff here at the Open Stories Foundation, we couldn't do it without uh, staff support as well. So thanks to the Mormon Stories staff and board of directors and to the donors. If you value this type of content and want to see it continue, if you want to see it live long and prosper for other people, please become a monthly donor. Go to the mormonstories.org website, click on the donate button, become a monthly donor. Uh, we're transparent in our finances. Uh, your tax, your donations are tax deductible in the U.S. And all the money we try and dedicate to the mission and the cause of the Open Stories Foundation. So please support us if you can. We appreciate it. Share these episodes with everyone. Give us your comments and feedback. Comment on YouTube. Comment on Facebook. Email us at mormonstories at gmail.com. Follow us on all the social medias, including TikTok, Instagram, uh, YouTube, and Facebook. And be kind to each other and be good to each other. And uh, we'll see you all again soon on another episode of